Jacob, Jacob had um, uh, some children by his daughter-in-law Tamar and Zara and Faris. And we might talk about Zara a bit later on, particularly in connection with Ireland. But tonight we're mostly following the house of the, the descendants of, of Faris. So we'll start off tonight in Genesis 49. We read this last week, but because we're dealing with the throne of David, we'll, we'll read it again. <clears throat> I might get Derek to read it if you don't mind. You able to do that, Derek? So it's um, 49 verse 8. What do we got here? So 49 verse 8. 8 to 12. So from verse 8 to 12. We did read this last week. We'll read it again, particularly just to do with the tribe of Judah. You're, you're muted still, Derek. There we go. Okay, just for uh, verse 8. You have 49 verse 8 through to verse 11, uh, verse 12. Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can. Okay. Judah, thou art he whom thy brethren shall praise. Thy hand shall be in thy neck of thine enemies. Thy father's children shall bow down before thee. Judah is a lion's root. From his, from the prey, my son, thou art gone up. He stooped down, he crouched as a lion, and as an old lion, who shall rouse him up. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet, until shallow come. And unto him shall a gathering of the people be. Binding his bow unto the vine, and his ass's colt unto the choice vine. He washed his garments in wine, and his clothes in the blood of grapes. His eyes shall be red with wine, and his teeth white with milk. So without trying to explain every little bit there, obviously the tribe of Judah was greatly chosen amongst the other 12. And we know that it's what we call the royal tribe. And particularly there in verse 9 says, how the scepter, uh, verse 10, the scepter shall not depart from Judah. So this is a reference to the royalty. And we're now particularly going to deal with um, King David. Um, well, let's go to First Chronicles chapter 5. We read this one last week too. We'll read it again. If I ever get it. Okay. First Chronicles chapter 5, just a couple of verses. Verses 1 and 2. Now the sons of Reuben, the firstborn of Israel, for he was the firstborn. But, but for as much as he defiled his father's bed, his birthright was given unto the sons of Joseph, the son of Israel. And the genealogy is not to be reckoned after the birthright. And then it says, Judah prevailed above his brethren, and of him came the chief ruler, but the birthright was of Joseph. So without dealing with Joseph tonight, we're talking about the house of Judah and how that he would rule or reign over his brethren, which we know happened later on to King David and his descendants, and he became the chief ruler. Let's go to Numbers chapter 23. I think next week when we go through talking about the children of Israel and the blessings that are, were upon them, some of the prophecies of Balaam, this crazy guy, that God used him to say some beautiful words about the children of Israel. But one of them is in, in chapter 23 of Numbers, and in verse 21, he hath not, talking about God beholding evil in Israel, because they were trying to curse Israel, if you remember, he hath not beheld iniquity in Jacob, 
neither has he seen perverseness in Israel. The Lord his God is with him, and it says, and the shout of a king is among them. So no matter all the mighty things that were said, the main point there is the shout of a king. So we know at some point there's going to be a, a king over Israel. Let's go to Ruth, the book of Ruth. What's that about? Judges. Judges. Just love the judges. The so, book of Ruth. And it's a great story. We know the story of Ruth and how she forsook her own people and her own pagan gods and followed the God of Israel and became an amazing person. But one of the big things to do with Ruth is part of the lineage of David. We see the last few verses of um, the book of Ruth. And I'm going to pick on um, Vince. Could you read that for me? So yeah. Chapter 4, verses 18 to 22. 18 to 22. Uh, now, these are the generations of Pharez. Pharez began Ezron, and Ezron begat Ram, and Ram begat Amin, Aminadab, and Amnadab begat Nashon, and Nashon begat Solomon. And Solomon begat Boaz, and Boaz begat Obed, and Obed begat Jesse, and Jesse begat David. So by the way that it's put in there, it's obviously the punchline of this little book is to get through to King David. It doesn't go before Fares, going back to Isaac, or is it? it doesn't go beyond David to Solomon. The punchline here is King David. Let's go to 1 Samuel, in chapter 30, just over a few more pages. Now, one of those unusual stories, somebody asked me this the other day, if God knew if Saul was going to be a bad king, then why did he make him king in the first place? Hope was trying to work that out. It's all part of God's plan. But we do know that it was never going to work because he was a Benjamite. We already read the promise back there in, in 49 of Genesis that the scepter was going to be with Judah. And here we just see here, when God was re rejecting Saul after the first mistake he made, made of a lot bigger one later with the Amalekites, but when he decided to um, make a sacrifice, which he wasn't supposed to do, <clears throat> First Samuel chapter 13, verse 14, and now thy kingdom, talking to Saul, Samuel to Saul, shall not continue. The Lord has sought him a man after his own heart, and the Lord has commanded him to be captain over his people, because thou hast not kept that which uh, the Lord the, the Lord commanded thee. So this is a reference directly to David. That's who he's talking about. Man after his own heart prophesied here. So your kingdom is going to stop. You know, I haven't got it written down here, but the amazing time when Jonathan, the son of Saul, arrayed David in, in his uh, own royal clothes, you might say, as the prince. And he, he also acknowledged that he was not going to be king and that David was going to be king. First Samuel chapter 16, the story, of course, the whole chapter about um, Samuel anointing David. Um, Monica, I wonder if I could get you to read. Thank you. Dangerous coming on this program. Yeah, very very dangerous. Morning. Okay, Monica, if you wouldn't mind just picking a little bit on David, what it says about him. In First Samuel chapter 16, Verse 12 and 13. And he sent and brought him in. And now he was ruddy and with all of a beautiful countenance and goodly to look to. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for this is he. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brethren. And the spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. So Samuel rose up and went to Ramah. I would almost think he fled to Ramah because... A very dangerous thing to anoint another king when the other king is still around, particularly when the king is Saul. But here we see the, I mean, there's so much you could say about David, not even touching on the story of David and Goliath, but we know it like the back of our head, but it really made David stand out as an amazing leader. Huge courage, courage beyond imagination of a young lad. We think maybe he's still a teenager 
at this point. And um, so um, you see what, you have, as they say, the heart of a lion. Uh, chapter 25, Samuel chapter, first Samuel chapter 25. Now, this is just grabbing a little bit of what Abigail said to David when David was going to come down and wipe out her, her would have killed her as well. The bad man named Nabal, 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 Nabal. And Abigail got on a horse and rode up and stopped David and said, Stop, you're going you're gonna to regret what you're doing and taking the law into your own hands, as we would say today. You're going to go and have vengeance on this bad man. But what I'm going to pick out is what she, in a sense, prophesied about him, and that's in um, verse 28. And she said to David, I pray that you forgive the trespass of thy handmaid, for the Lord will certainly make my Lord a sure house, because my Lord fighteth the battles of the Lord, and evil have not been found in thee all thy days. So mm -hmm. one of the main points we're making today is that the throne of David was prophesied that it would keep going. It wouldn't just be for a short time like Saul's was, but it would keep going. Go to First Kings chapter two. By the way, David took her advice and really praised her for, for what she did. Later on, of course, the uh, happy story. He married her. The only mm -hmm. downside was he already had a few wives. Not quite, but not not quite the love match that you might talk about. But <laughs> she was. She really was a beautiful person, inside and out. So, in um, First Kings chapter two, long chapter. So I've done, jumped ahead. There's so much you could say about David when he was the king. He had a hard life. You know, his own son Absalom rose up against. I think he had another son did, did the same later on. So. Not that that's unusual when you're a king of a country or a leader. There's always somebody waiting in the wind to take your, get into your shoes. But it was a sad day for when Absalom was slain and, and so on. So he had a, a hard life. He only got to 70. At the moment, I look back and he did. That was a long time ago for me. 17 doesn't seem a very long life. He literally, you might say, wore himself out. He was a great man of war. He lived in the wilderness maybe for about 13 years from being a teenager through to maybe the age of 30, when he became king over, first of all, the house of Judah for seven years, then all the house of Israel, as the Bible prophesied, we read that he would rule over them for another 33 years. By the time we got to seven, he was literally worn out. So we'll just read here in, in chapter, first King chapter two, and just verse one to four, and I'm going to pick on Pastor Martin. So chapter, the first thing, chapter 2, verse 1 to 4. What's that, now, right? now, the days yeah. of David, now the days of David drew near that he should die. And he charged Solomon, his son, saying, I go the way of all the earth. Be thou strong, therefore, and show thyself a man. And keep the charge of the, of the Lord thy God to walk in his ways, to keep his statutes and, to, and his commandments and his judgments and his testimonies as it is written in the law of Moses, that thou mayest prosper in all that thou doest and whithersoever thou turnest uh, thyself. Um, that the Lord may continue his word, which he spake concerning me, saying, if the children, if thy children take uh, heed to their way to walk before me, in truth with all their heart and with all their soul there shall not fail thee said he a man on the throne of israel so here is basically a prophecy that his throne would continue not just for a few hundred years but forever we're going to see other ones it really does establish that um let's go oh by the way i was just thinking there how he he was concerned about what happened after he died he might have thought well, oh, well i've done i've done my bit who cares what happened once I'm dead? But now he had instructions for Solomon. He worried about the future. He wanted the, the blessing of the Lord to remain with Israel. I think of Peter in the New Testament. 
in Second Peter chapter one, where Peter said, "You know, I'm about to depart, and uh, but after I've gone, I, I want you to do this and that." And uh, these guys didn't just live for their own life, but they were worried about what happened after them. Let's go to First Kings chapter eight. I'm just going to grab a little bit of um, the dedication of the temple by the son of David. A lot, a lot in there, but we're just going to grab a little bit of it. In 1 Kings chapter 8 and verse 25, I'll read it. Therefore now, therefore now, Lord God of Israel, keep with thy servant David, my father, that thou promised him, promised us him, saying, there shall not, for we just read that before, there shall not fail of a man in my sight to sit upon the throne of Israel, so that thy children take heed in their way. They will walk before me as thou hast walked before me. Uh, and now, O God uh, of Israel, let thy word, I pray thee, be verified, which thou spake unto thy servant David, my father. So, Solomon, of course, ended up being a, a disappointment himself, but he started off really good and he was very godly, made a couple of wrong moves and led him away. But what he said here was fantastic. And he just said, look, I don't want to, as it were, usurp my father. I don't want to change anything. I just love to keep going all the wonderful things that God has done with my father. Let's go to Psalm 89. Pastor Warren, are you up to doing a bit of reading or you're not feeling too good or you're feeling good or what? You're muted. I'll give it a go, Pastor John. Because I've got quite a bit for you to read. Okay. So first of all, Psalm 89, verse 1 to 4. Okay. Verse 1 to 4. Yeah. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. With my mouth will I make known thy faithfulness to all generations. For I have said, mercy shall be built up forever. Thy faithfulness shall thou establish in the very heavens. I have made a covenant with my chosen. I have sworn unto David my servant. Thy seed will I establish forever and build up thy throne to all generations. So, uh, so is it God really... So God really committing himself here. Um, a bit of an unusual one, because we know that David made a couple of major mistakes. But one good thing about David was he was very good at repenting. One thing to make a mistake and not to get, get it sorted out. But David always got it sorted out. He never tried to blame anybody else. He just blamed himself. He said, I've done the wrong thing. I've sinned. God, forgive me. God, don't take the Holy Ghost from me, restore unto me the days of salvation and so on. So later on, God, to prove that God forgave him, he said all these wonderful things about David. And I think it's a great message in there of, of mercy and forgiveness. If we turn back to God with a heart like David, then God will forgive us and we can go on with our walk in the Lord. I want to read a bit more. There's a lot in this chapter about David uh, and what we're talking about, how that his throne would continue. I'm going to get past the Warren, if you wouldn't mind, to read from verse 20. We'll read the whole chapter later. It's a big chapter. In verse 20, right down to verse 37. You're up to that, Pastor Warren? Yeah, we'll give it a go, Pastor John. You're doing well. Good on you. Uh, verse 20, I have found David my servant. With my holy oil have I anointed him. With whom my hand shall be established. Mine arm also shall strengthen him. The enemy shall not exact upon him, nor the sons of wickedness afflict him. And I will beat down his foes before his face and plague them that hate him. But my faithfulness and my mercy shall be with him, and in my name shall his horn be exalted. I will set his hand also in the sea and his right hand in the rivers. He shall cry unto me, Thou art my Father, my God, and the rock of my salvation. 
also I will make him my firstborn, higher than the kings of the earth. My mercy will I keep for him forevermore, and my covenant shall stand fast with him. His seed also will I make to endure forever, and his throne as the days of heaven. If his children forsake my law and walk not in my judgments, if they break my statutes and keep not my commandments, then will I visit their transgression with the rod and their iniquity with stripes. Nevertheless, my loving kindness will I not utterly take from him, nor suffer my faithfulness to fail. My covenant will I not break, nor alter the thing that has gone out of my lips. Once I have sworn by my holiness that I will not lie unto David, his seed shall endure forever, and his throne as the sun before me. It shall be established forever as the moon, and as a faithful witness in heaven. So I. Is that what we went up to? Yes, as, as I said, there's a lot more there. Aren't they absolutely beautiful words? and so poetically written as um, we know. But God really did commit himself big time here. And if God keeps his word, and we know that he does, then somewhere on planet Earth today, there really should be what we call the throne of David. And we're going to maybe deal with that a little bit more in the last talk. But the, the thought is that it would be an enduring throne. What we do know is it did cease in Israel. In 586 BC, when the Babylonians came down and smashed Jerusalem, burnt down the temple, and they took away the last king of descendant of David, Zedekiah, uh, and took him away uh, uh, blind uh, to, to Babylon, to die in Babylon. <coughs> the, the throne of David did not continue in, in, in Israel. We know it stopped there. I dare say a whole thought tonight is that it did continue elsewhere. It's all a little bit vague, of course, because history doesn't always record every event, but we, we have things that are established in Ireland, later on in Scotland, later on in England, that seem to really direct us back to these promises, that there would be a throne, and we can identify a lot of things to do with, we're talking about the British throne, to do with, with, the, with the throne of David. So um, let's go to Jeremiah now, chapter 33. By the way, this is a huge subject and mostly can't really cover it all perfectly, but I think we get the general gist of it. We've now jumped 400 years. So we talked about David and the promises God made in the Psalms and, and back there in, in the other parts of the Bible we read. And now we're jumping right through to that time of 586 BC, maybe a few years before that say 590 BC, and, and here we see um, with Jeremiah, it's um, amazing that Jeremiah, because he did what God told him to do any of it, he prophesied about the throne of David when staring him in the face right then at that time with the last four kings of Judah, all really, really bad guys, Jehoahaz, Jehoiakim, Jehoahaz, Chin and Zedekiah, all the sons of Josiah, who was a very good king. The last four were real bad. And right in the midst of while Jeremiah's prophesying, he's talking about this great throne that's going to continue. And yet at that time, the kings of Judah were very bad guys. So we'll pick it up in Jeremiah chapter 33. And just one verse to start on, verse 17. For thus saith the Lord, David shall never want for a man to sit upon the throne of the house of Israel. Well, we read that before that God would always provide. But here we are 400 years later, and within a, a hair's breadth, a stone's throw, a bull's roar away from, they were going to cease in Israel. He makes this amazing prophecy right now that there will always be somebody somewhere that will be connected to the throne of David. Down in verse 19. Um, <clears throat> And the word of the Lord came under Jeremiah, saying, Thus saith the Lord, if you can break my covenant of the day, and my covenant of the night, and there should not, that there should not be a day and night, I better start again, and that there should not be 
day and night in, in their season, then may also my covenant be broken with David, my servant, that he should not have a, a son to reign upon the house and with the Levites, the priests, by the, my, my, sorry, priests, my ministers. And verse 22, as the host of heaven cannot be numbered, think of the multitude of stars that we, we now know, the myriad, myriads of galaxies and so on, neither the sand on the seashore, which is literally immeasurable, so will I multiply the seed of David, my servant, and the Levites that, that minister unto, unto me. So here's God right at the end of the, of the time of the house of Judah being in, in Israel, committing himself for the future. He said, you can go out tomorrow morning and see the sun, or you can go out tonight and see the, the, the moon and the stars, you walk down to the beach and look at the sand, just as you can't count that, they're going to be the descendants of David. Not only the children of Israel, but the descendants of David. There are some fantastic promises there. We doubt, and I did mention that at the time, the other descendants of Abraham, like Ishmael and the Arabs, and like Esau and the Edomites, and later on people like the Moabites and the Ammonites and the Philistines and all these people, they went on living right where they are to this day. They never immigrated. They never went anywhere. So they are there. But these people are going to spread out as, as we go across the earth. Let's go to Ezekiel in chapter 17. So what really happened? 586 BC, a, a linchpin, a pivotal point, middle of the axle, the middle of the wheel, the axle of the wheel. Everything revolves around 586 BC, the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple by Nebuchadnezzar. Um, what we do find is that there were some descendants of Zedekiah that stayed alive. His sons all got killed. That was the last thing he saw before he had his eyes put out. You might think, well, that's it. It's all over Red Rover. But it wasn't. There were two daughters, at least two just daughters that, of the king that survived and were hanging around with Jeremiah and stuck with him and Barak, the servant, and most probably Ebed Melech, the, uh, the eunuch, and these people with Jeremiah. When Jeremiah was captured and they realized who he was, Nebuchadnezzar, the captain of the, of the, of the army of Nebuchadnezzar, said, look, we know who you are, and you've got a fantastic reputation, I'm putting it in modern-day words, and you are not going to be taken captive to Babylon. We're not going to hurt you at all. In actual fact, the old saying, we'll give you the keys of the, of the city, although the city was destroyed. We'll give you open, open doors so that you can come and go whatever you like. So that's the way they treated Zedek, uh, Jeremiah. So um, the prophecy here, we think, everything indicates to the future of the, of the descendants of Zedekiah, the two daughters. We're going to look at that in a minute. It just says here in Ezekiel chapter 17 and verse 22, Granville. Can you read this? So it's Ezekiel, yeah. Yeah. Ezekiel 17, 22 to 24. But thus saith the Lord God, I will also take of the highest branch of the high cedar and will set it, I will crop off from the top of the young twigs, a tender one, and will plant it upon a high mountain and eminent. In the mountain of the height of Israel will I plant it, and it shall bring forth boughs, and bear fruit, and be a goodly cedar. And under it shall dwell all fowl of every wing. In the shadow of the branches thereof shall they dwell. And all the trees of the field shall know that I, I the Lord, have brought down the high tree, have exalted the low tree, having dried up the green tree, having made the dry tree to flourish. For I, the Lord, have spoken, 
of an undone building. So it's an amazing prophecy, obviously something of great importance, particularly when the Lord finishes off by saying, I have spoken it and I've done it. Now, this is something, you're going to crop off the tender twigs, the whole thought being these are the, the surviving daughters of Zedekiah who travelled with Jeremiah. The basic thought that we have, and it's, I guess that's a big part of our belief, is that Jeremiah did not die in Israel. Jeremiah did not die in Babylon. Jeremiah did not die in Egypt. But the thought was, and by the way, it's not a hard thing to imagine that he travelled through the Mediterranean Sea to Ireland and Britain, because the Phoenicians and people like him, they were constantly trading along the coast of Spain and England and Ireland. Quite a common thing in that particular day. So the fact that Jeremiah could have been taken by them, and um, I dare say we bring in now the Stone of Destiny, <laughs> covering a lot in one night here. The Stone of Destiny, which is the most valuable antiquity in the whole of Great Britain, it is the most precious part of the crown jewels, uh, guarded day and night with, with the soldiers of Britain, and um, it has the legend, and we use the word legend. I'm going to quote Pastor Warren here. Pastor Warren once said to me, myth and fable most probably have no foundation or anything, but legend often were some facts back there that were there, down through the ages, maybe this bit's been lost or that bit's been added. It was not perfect, but there was a substance to the legend. Is that right, Pastor Warren? Good. So <laughs> being a historian, and when you often listen, you listen on TV, you've got a program on Egypt or and they've got the, the expert, and you'll hear them quote legend. You'll hear them quote, it is thought to be, some, some visualize this. Or we imagine this, they've got all these words that say they don't definitely know. Why? Because there is nothing definite in a lot of the, the things that happened 1,000, 2,000, 3,000 years ago. Without legend, we actually wouldn't have anything. So work on that. So the legend is that Jeremiah went to Ireland with the tender twigs, meaning the daughters of Zedekiah, and went there. And when it says there, um, Verse 24 again, um, I brought down the high tree, I've exalted the, I brought down the high tree, that was the death of the removal of Zedekiah, and I've exalted the, the low tree, the sword is, and again I'm rushing it. We go right back to the beginning of Fares and Zara. How much we can cover that next week, I don't know, but the sword is the descendants of Zara, who were supposed to be born first, if you remember, at the, the red cord put around his, his uh, arm by the midwife, but then the little hand were taken back inside his mum, and his brother got born before him. Well, Zara, that was Fares, who means breach of uh, um, sorry? Fares, I forgot the name. Fares means breach. The descendants of Zara, so these five sons, isn't it? It's, some of them immigrated through to Ireland and became, I'm really rushing things here, became the high kings of Ireland. And when the daughters arrived in Ireland and they married into actually the house of Zara, so the house of Fares, in the form of the two girls or more, married into the house of Zara and the house of Judah came back together again. Here's the basic story that we're trying to cover in one night. Anyhow, let's go to. Um, uh, chapter 41, I just mention here of Ezekiel, by the way, chapter 41 of Ezekiel. Verse 1. Uh, Helen and I have found, and many other people in the fellowship have found this story, one of the most fascinating you can go. We went to a place called Devonish Island in Northern Ireland many years ago, a few years ago has the legend that Jeremiah was buried on that island. Not, not through any of our beliefs, it's the Irish legend. He'd been buried a few places, but the most common one was on Devonish Island in Northern Ireland. And when we went to visit it, um, Helen was sitting on the boat with a great heap of Irish tourists. By the way, broad Irish, is, it's hard to understand, it's broad Scots, 
I don't think I could have anybody understand, understand anybody on that boat. Now, Helen heard one lady say to another lady, you know that there's a legend that Jeremiah, that's why we were there, by the way, that Jeremiah was buried on this, uh, on this island. Without going into the whole story, Helen quizzed the, the um, tour guide, Stephen, wasn't it? And said, did you know this? He said, yes, we used to say it, but we've been told we're not allowed to talk about it anymore, mainly because of racism, because the Jewish people, and this is interesting, the Jewish people come from the Middle East to Devonshire because they believe that that's where Jeremiah is buried. Mm -hmm. There's no tomb to Jeremiah in the mountains of, of Judah or Babylon or, or Egypt or, or Spain, for, for if you went through Spain. But the legend is that he was buried in Northern. And I admit it's a legend, but it's uh, interesting. We're not the only ones that maybe think that. So here we are, 41 verse 10. Oh, yes, sorry. You've got all Ezekiel, forget Ezekiel. Jeremiah, Jeremiah 41. My PA picked that up. <laughs> <laughs> Jeremiah 41. Without going into everything, this is after the fall of Babylon, uh, the fall of Jerusalem by the Babylonians. In that period, towards the end of everything, it just says here in 41 verse 10, then Ishmael carried away captive all the residue of the people that were in Mizpah, even the king's daughters and all the people which remained in Mizpah. And so it goes on. So um, yes, you need to read the rest I get, of it. I get another one. Yeah, another chapter 43, just over the page. 43 verse 6, and even men and women and children and the king's daughter and every person that Nebuchadnezzar, the captain of the guard, had left with Gedaliah, the son of Hayakim, the son of Shaphan, and Jeremiah the prophet, and Barak the son of Neriah. He doesn't mention Ebed Melech, I positive he'd be there, but interesting thought about Ebed Melech, he was a eunuch. And the eunuchs were always looked uh, in, in a palace to look after the, the concubines and the wives of the kings and so on. They were there to protect them. So when you think of these two daughters of Zedekiah, somebody like Ebed Melech would have been a common sight for them because he would have been protected by them. He was a very godly man. He's the guy that pulled Jeremiah out of the pit when Jeremiah was sinking up to his, up to his chin and he let down <coughs> ropes and pulled him up and the Lord promised him, he said, you will not perish. I'll reward you for doing this. You will not perish with the others. So I'm betting, but it doesn't mention Ebed Melech. I reckon he would have been there too. It but it does, the it mentions, oh, it does say the units, you're right. Well, let's say that. Somewhere there, maybe in the other one. Yeah. Mentions the eunuch, so it doesn't name him by name. Yeah. So there we are, we have this little group carted down to Egypt, they didn't want to go down to Egypt, and all of them got wiped out, and Jeremiah was left alive. Um, so, Psalm 45. How are we going? About a quarter of an hour. Because we've got a bit of reading now, and Helen insisted that she does this reading, because <laughs> she um, likes this chapter. There's one we discovered, if I can dare to use that word, a few years ago, it seemed to fit the bill, that's all I'll say of the daughters of Zedekiah and their journey through to Ireland. Psalm 45, I'll get there, Michelle. So we're gonna read the whole chapter. My heart is indicting a good matter. I speak of the things which I have made touching the king. My tongue is the pen of a ready writer. Thou art fairer than the children of man, men. Grace is poured into thy lips. Therefore God hath blessed thee forever. Gird thy sword upon thy thigh, O most mighty, with the glory, thy glory and thy majesty. And in thy majesty ride prosperously because of truth and meekness and righteousness. And thy right hand shall teach thee terrible things. Thine arrows are sharp in the heart of the king's enemies. Thereby the people fall under thee. Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. 
The scepter of thy kingdom is a right scepter. Thou lovest righteousness and hatest wickedness. Therefore God, thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. All thy garments smell of myrrh and aloes and cassia out of the ivory palaces whereby they have made thee glad. King's daughters were among thy honourable women. Upon thy right hand did stand the queen in gold of Ophir. Hearken, O daughter, and consider, and incline thine ear. Forget also thine own people and thy father's house. So shall the king greatly desire thy beauty, for he is thy lord, and worship thou him. And the daughter of Tyre shall be there with a gift. Even the rich among the people shall entreat thy favour. The king's daughter is all glorious within. Her clothing is of wrought gold. She shall be brought unto the king in raiment of needlework. The virgins, her companions that follow her, shall be brought unto thee. With gladness and rejoicing shall they be brought. They shall enter into the king's palace. Instead of thy father shall be thy children, whom thou make, mayest make princes in all the earth. I will make thy name to be remembered in all generations. Therefore shall the people praise thee forever and ever. It seems to be a perfect description of these two girls named Tamar Tifi and, and um, Scotia, 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 Scotia. And, um, that's the legend. Anyhow, I'm only quoting the legend. It's interesting. It says that their name would be remembered. And the sort of the critical part of this is verse 9. King's daughters were among the honourable women. And then in verse 10, hearken, O daughter, and consider and incline you to forget also thine own people. They were going to leave Palestine. Their dad, their dad was killed, you know, taken captive. All the brothers, all the princes were destroyed and forget thine own people and thy father's house. Then right at the end, instead of thy father's princes, her brothers, their brothers, shall be thy children. So they have new children, and we believe, and she married in a guy called Eoke in, in Ireland, the high kings of Ireland, and those children would then continue on, is the basic story. Uh, that thou mayest make princes in all the earth, and to make thy name to be remembered in all generations. Therefore shall the people praise thee forever and ever. Well, that's basically what's happened. Okay, mm -hmm. let's go to Ezekiel 30, 27. One more scripture after this. So I do believe that this is a reference to the throne of David leaving the Middle East and being transferred through to Ireland, through to Scotland, through to England eventually. Ezekiel 27, pretty famous couple of verses in our fellowship. That's not right, is it? Oh, Where is the scripture on overturn, overturn? That's the one we're looking for. Oh, it's 20, 21, Ezekiel uh, 21. Yeah, it uh, it's Helen's fault. I've got to blame somebody. <laughs> okay, Ezekiel 21, verse oh. 25. And thou, I'm going to put the names in here, and thou profane wicked prince of Israel, Zedekiah, whose day is come when iniquity shall have an end. And thus saith the Lord God, remove the diadem, take the crown off him, take off the crown. This shall not be the same. It's going to continue, but not the same. No longer going to be. There was a king at the time of Jesus, his name was Herod, but he was not the real king. He was an Egyptian king, not the line of David. Remove the diadem, take off the crown, this shall not be the same. Exalt him with his line, referring to the other scripture we read was along that line as well, exalting the line, 
the form of the high kings of, of, of Ireland. Um, and um, uh, and then at the end of the verse 26, and abasing the disciples, that was bringing down Zedekiah and the, and the line of David at that time. And then he says, I will overturn, overturn, overturn it, and it shall be no more until he come, whose right it is, and I will give it him to the prophecy of Jesus' right of being, coming back to this throne. So the thought is that somewhere on planet Earth today is the throne of David that Jesus is going to come back to. How that's all going to come together, we don't know. It doesn't matter. Uh, I often say one of the reasons I mainly believe this is I can't dot every I and cross every T over the last two or 3,000 years. But when I look at the prophecies that we read here in the Bible, then I look at what's happened, particularly with the stone of destiny and the, the British throne and all the line coming through. It's all there. How, how it all happened in the middle, I'm not sure. I don't know how exactly, but it did happen. And um, uh, that's why mostly I we greatly believe it. We're going to finish tonight in Luke chapter 1. You have a great fulfillment of the house of David, of course, is Jesus Christ. Luke chapter 1. So what happens? 586 BC, we have the diaspora, the dispersion of the Jews. Uh, a lot of them were taken into Babylon. Some of them were scattered. Already the 10 tribes have been scattered. We're going to cover that next week. And then later on, the two tribes, the house of Judah, were scattered. But the Bible says a remnant, about 50,000, came back from Babylon. And that was at the time of the Persians. The Babylonian kings were not very nice to the children of Israel. Although there were times when God used one of, the, one of his servants to interpret a dream or something, they were quite nice. But generally, the kings of Babylon were not all that nice. The, the kingdom of Babylon didn't last very long, only lasted 70 years. I think the only kingdom that was shorter was the Nazis in the Second World War, only went for 11 years. But the Babylonian, the Babylonian kingdom was ended in 539 BC when Cyrus, Cyrus, Cyrus the king of Persia, and then all the Persian kings were good. One after the other, all good Darius and all the, all the other ones were good to, to the children of Israel. And where was I going with that? I've, I've lost my line of thought. Okay. Oh, I'm talking about the remnant. So under, under particular Ezra and Nehemiah, those two great leaders, a lot of children came back to Jerusalem, rebuilt the temple first of all, under Zerubbabel. And about 100 years later, they repaired the wall. Well, at that time, finished the temple, and then eventually, under Nehemiah, they rebuilt the wall. City Jerusalem was a going concern again, and that remnant were descendants of King David. We have, we can read Matthew one and Luke chapter one, and Luke chapter three, I think it is, the lineage, whatever it was, Luke, Luke three. And Matthew 1, the lineage of Jesus and Mary, Joseph and Mary. And, but it was important that they did because Jesus had to come. We needed Jews back in Jerusalem. So we read there in verse 27 of Luke 1. To a virgin, when the angels came, Gabriel, to a virgin, a spouse to a man whose surname was Joseph, of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. So wasn't just going to be any person had to be a descendant of the royal line of David. And Mary and both Mary and Joseph, we won't go into the two leaders, but they, they are fully covered there. We're, 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 God made sure that uh, it came through to them. And Jesus was born, in a sense, a descendant of a descendant of David. And we just finished in verse 30. Christine, would you read that? So it's Luke chapter 1, verse 30 to verse 33. And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favour with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son, 
and shall call his name Jesus. And he shall be great and shall be called the son of the highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there shall be no end. So when we talk about the throne of David and all its implications and all its fulfillment, we really are talking about one of the most fantastic stories in the Bible. I started off by saying a couple of weeks ago, you take the miracles out of the Bible, you haven't got a Bible. You take the children of Israel out of the Bible, you haven't got a Bible. The whole Testament is dealing totally pretty well with the children of Israel. And then when we come into the New Testament, it is still all there. That lineage is so important. It's funny, you know, I'm going to finish on this thought. When people start reading a Bible and the first witness to them, they, get it, they say, I got into all the begats and the begots. Mm -hmm. I didn't know where to go. Guess what? The begats and the begots have got a good story. And now you're in the Lord. You don't have to be put off by that. It's, it's interesting looking at those images. So there we are. We're talking about the throne of David, blessed of God, and, oh, yes, Helen's got right, written down here, Queen Victoria's quote. We found a little quote from Queen Victoria when she was sitting in a, in a meeting in the Church of England, I think, and the Dean gave a talk on the second coming. And she went up to the Dean after and said, my great ambition would be that I'd like to be alive when Jesus returns and I'd like to lay the, the crown of Britain at his feet. Mm -hmm. That Queen Victoria quote there. Mm -hmm. So that's it, brethren. Good night and God bless you. Amen. <laughs> <laughs>